Ancient Egypt is one of the most enduring and revered civilizations in history, and what remains of it has become iconic symbols recognized throughout the world today. This episode is going to take a look at its very beginning and discover the first pharaoh who united its lands into one nation. Ancient Egypt's history is an astonishing 3,000 years, which is an exceptionally long time when compared to other civilizations. It is measured from the first dynasty when it was unified into one single kingdom until the death of Cleopatra when it became a Roman province. Now, there is still much debate as to the date Egypt was first unified, as we were talking about an extremely long time ago, around 5,000 years. However, the dates proposed by Egyptologists fall between 3,200 to 2,950 BC. So let's take a look at the map. Of course, the most prominent feature is the Nile. It flows from south to north and empties out into the Mediterranean Sea. Because the Nile flows this way, the Egyptian perspective was that the north is in Lower Egypt and the south is in Upper Egypt. Along the Nile was extremely fertile, particularly in the Delta region, where the river fans out into its various branches. However, aside from that, Egypt is surrounded by inhospitable desert, with the exception of a number of oases dotted around here and there. At the time of the first pharaoh, Egypt was divided into two kingdoms, Upper Egypt in the south and Lower Egypt in the north. The uniting of these two lands under one ruler signified the beginning of its history. So who was this first pharaoh? Well, there are two names that claim this title. The first is Menes. Menes was listed by Manetho, a historian that lived in Egypt during the last dynasty. The problem with Menes is that not a single shred of archaeological evidence has ever been found to support the claim that Menes even ever existed. And of course, Manetho lived almost 3,000 years after unification took place. So the reliability of this evidence is in serious question. The second name is Nama, of which we have enough archaeological evidence dating back to unification to safely say Nama was the first pharaoh. However, it has been suggested that Menes and Nama were the same person as it was common for pharaohs to have multiple names. In order to tell this story, we need to look at the best evidence we have from this period, the Nama Palette. It was found in the ancient city of Hierakonopolis in Upper Egypt. Palettes like these were used to ground cosmetics. Both men and ladies would create a charcoal-based eyeliner applied beneath the eye to absorb the glare of the sun. The Nama palette, however, is not a typical palette of its kind. It's far larger than most and highly decorated, which tells the story of Egypt's unification. This was a ceremonial palette. The palette is split into sections on each side and can be read like a book to tell the story of how the two kingdoms became one. And that's exactly what we're going to do. At the top of the palette is a name. Egyptian hieroglyphs are part phonetic and part picture representations. In this case, the symbols are used phonetically. The first symbol is a fish, meaning na, and the second a chisel, meaning mer. Together gives us the name Nama. The name is within what we call a sereh. This is a representation of a palace. Therefore, Nama's name is snugly fitted in the palace, indicating he is the king. On either side, we have a cow's head representing the goddess Hathor. She was the divine mother and protectress, often represented as a cow or with cow features. On the layer below, in the centre of the pallet, we see Nama himself. In his hand, he holds his mace a primitive weapon which is basically a rock on a stick, used to whack people with. In his other hand, he grabs his enemy by the hair, about to clobber him. This is one of the most oldest known representations of a pharaoh 
in what we call the smiting pose. Pharaohs will continue to portray themselves in this pose for the next 3,000 years. And most importantly, Nama is wearing the white crown. This signifies that he is the ruler of Upper Egypt. To the king's left, we see his sandal bearer. And as the title implies, he is carrying the king's sandals. This may sound like an unimportant job, but the position made him one of the pharaoh's most top advisors. To the right, we have a representation of a hawk plucking at the nose of the enemy. The hawk represents the god Horus. It was believed that the pharaoh was the physical embodiment of Horus on earth, and therefore the pharaoh was considered divine. This guy, being so mistreated by the bird, has papyrus plants growing out of his back. The papyrus plant is a symbol of Lower Egypt in the north, whereas the lotus flower, a symbol of Upper Egypt in the south. Therefore, Nama is in battle with the kingdom of Lower Egypt. On the bottom layer, we see these guys. The uncomfortable positioning of their bodies tells us that they are among the dead and the defeated. If we turn the palette over, the story continues. The top layer is the same as the previous side. The pharaoh's name between two cow heads, representing the goddess Hathor. On the layer below, we see a victory parade with Nama in the center. Notice how much bigger he is than the rest. In ancient Egyptian art, they practiced what we call hierarchical proportions. The concept is simple. The more important you are and the higher your rank, the larger your image. And none is more important in Egyptian society than the pharaoh. But more importantly, Nama is now wearing the red crown, an indication that he is now the ruler of Lower Egypt, as well as Upper Egypt. Once again, behind the pharaoh, we see the sandal bearer, still carrying the sandals. In front of the pharaoh is the visor. Notice he is the same size as the sandal bearer, signifying they are equal in rank. He's in this strange sort of hunched position because he's wearing a leopard skin, signifying his position. The visor's role is kind of like a prime minister. I have wondered why the visor was not on the first side of the palette. My best guess was probably because he was running the kingdom while the pharaoh was away on campaign and just turned up for the parade. These smaller guys are pole bearers. We think that they make up regiments or regions of the pharaoh's army. To the far right, we see a series of guys lying on the ground. They've been decapitated, their heads placed between their legs. These poor guys were clearly captives, executed for the parade. A reminder of just how violent this world was. Above them, a boat, maybe the pharaoh's boat, filled with war booty. Or was there a naval element involved in this campaign? We can only speculate. On the layer below, these two fantastical mythical beasts. They are serpentine leopards. Images of these beasts are common in Mesopotamia and demonstrate a mixing of ideas between these two cultures at this time. However, from this point onwards, Egyptian art and culture becomes ever more distinctive. The necks of these two beasts are collared by these two guys. The two necks entwined creates a neat circle. This was where the cosmetics would be ground up if the palette was ever to be used this way. On the bottom layer, we see a bull. It's trampling down the enemy. The object to the right is a walled city of which the bull is smashing down its walls. If you haven't guessed it already, the bull represents Nama himself. However, I don't believe Nama's army actually smashed down any walls as there were no siege weapons capable of doing so at this time in history. If there was a city sacked, it would have been achieved by starving the inhabitants out or bribing a guy on the inside to open the gates. Either way, the story on the palette is clear. Nama, the king of Upper Egypt, added Lower Egypt to his rule by military conquest, uniting the two lands in the process. Further evidence has been found, the Nama Macehead. A ceremonial mace head depicting Pharaoh Nama 
conducting his jubilee. The purpose of this festival was to renew the king's potency and fertility over the land. We know it took place after unification, as Nama is depicted wearing the red crown. This also suggests a fairly lengthy reign. We even know where his tomb is. He was buried at the site of Abydos in Upper Egypt. Here are some of Egypt's oldest tombs, some dating back over 6,000 years. The tombs at this site were simple ditches with mud bricks. So what was the legacy of Nama's unification? Well, first and foremost, it left a strong central government. The absolute authority of the pharaohs meant that they could implement policies designed to maximise all of Egypt's resources. The annual flooding of the Nile made Egypt extremely rich in agriculture. This allowed the pharaohs to allocate manpower elsewhere. Later pharaohs could afford a standing army and the full-time production of weapons for war. This gave Egypt the edge over its rivals and allowed them to dominate the region. This was particularly useful when accumulating gold for example, the vast majority of which was imported from Nubia. So, what of Nama's legacy? First and foremost, Nama was victorious in battle, a victory that doubled the size of his kingdom and forced a nation that was powerful, wealthy and stable. And to top it all off, he began a history that was to span 3,000 years. Thank you.